Christy, you want to introduce yeah. the panelists and also talk about the poll results so we can start the conversation. Yeah, so how about we, um, why don't we start with the poll first, just to kind of get a feel of what everybody's doing. I don't know, Daniel, if you, are you able to share the results of the poll? They are fantastic. So they should be up on your screen now, and we'll just do kind of a quick run through of it. Um, so, I mean, it, we've got a nice mix. I'm happy to see that first question was just to kind of get a sense of the audience. So we really do have a mix of uh, of everybody. I know Bernadita was speaking about uh, the, the West Coast is a little experiencing the heat, whereas we on the Northeast are seeing some uh, some wet weather. So it's nice to kind of see the mix of, of audience there. Um, but in terms of the question, so the, the second question, we asked um, what heat events have you had to deal with recently? And uh, and it looks as though two thirds or so of the group, uh, the majority is the, that extreme seasonal temperature variability outside of the norms, um, but also certainly some uh, experiencing early onset or delayed temperatures, um, lesser overnight temperature changes. So the, those nights are staying warmer than expected. Um, but there are a few who responded who are not uh, experiencing any of that, those lucky few who aren't experiencing those things. Um, we looking at in terms of what sort of mitigation techniques or efforts people have been trying, um, the uh, the two kind of uh, two that came out on top, uh, there are some that are trying things like shade cloth or hail netting, um, as well as irrigation of the orchard floor. Um, a few that are trying things like overhead cooling, reducing mowing, um, but again, about a third or so of respondents um, are not using any mitigation techniques at all. Um, from a harvest standpoint, um, the, the biggest concern looks to be that the issues around reduced or delayed color development. Um, but uh, but certainly also things like fruit finish issues um, and potential for storage issues or increased disorders. Um, and the last question that we had, again, just to kind of go through these quickly, was then looking at how things have changed from an operational standpoint, if you're making any sort of uh, changes to your practices based on extreme heat events. Um, and it looks as though over a third are not doing any sort of uh, changes at the moment to deal with these heat events, but there are some that are implementing things like extended break for workers and, um, and doing, there's a few that look like they're doing some, you know, evening harvest and, and those sort of options, but um, so that, um, appreciate those that did respond. Um, what we'll do is introduce um, the grower panel at this time, and uh, and they can kind of share their similar to those questions that we just asked. Maybe go into a little bit detail of it with, the, with themselves. So um, we've got two growers that are joining us. Unless do we have Randy Hart? Tap in. I'm not sure if he was able to make it. Otherwise, um, the other two, if you if you're able to put on your uh, your cameras as we introduce, then that would be wonderful. I'd like to introduce Steve Freecon. Uh, and he joins us from Freecon Farms in Pennsylvania, as well as Garrett Henry from Douglas Fruit in Washington. Um, so thank you both for joining. Appreciate it. I'm wondering if maybe you could start us off just kind of introducing your, your operation in the sense of um, what sort of issues you've had to deal with in the last few years from, uh, from heat events um, and, and just a little bit of detail with that. Um, let's see, I saw Garrett pop on first. So Garrett, do you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we're in the Columbia Basin, and uh, we generally do have a lot of uh, high temperatures, so we uh, typically do uh, control measures for sunburn. But the last few years, we've had uh, some extreme heat, and uh, so it's required re rethinking some of the some of the things we've been doing. And uh, do you want me to go into some of the things we do, or that would be wonderful? Yeah. Okay. So in in, in general. Uh, we net we net some of our um, varieties and and then basically on everything else, unless we have water quality issues, we uh, either overhead cool and, or we use um, sun protectants like surround. So we use surround on varieties like uh, Honeycrisp and and uh, Grannies where we don't overhead cool. And for everything else, we use uh, a, mic a micro like a calcium. Uh, carbonate product. Oh, 
Okay, Steve, do you want to give a little introduction there? Yeah, hi, Steve Freycon, uh, Boyertown, Pennsylvania. We're about an hour uh, northwest of Philadelphia. Um, we don't quite struggle with the heat issues that the West Coast does. You know, for us, the, the major kind of concerns are more when it gets into the upper 90s during gala harvest. You know, we'll experience temperatures of 96, 98 degrees. And the big challenges that that causes for us is coloring overnight. So we won't get the cool temperatures that they get up in like New York State. Uh, so we have a day on our farm in particular, we have a very difficult time coloring Honeycrisp, coloring Macintosh, um, a lot of those cultivars that need cool nighttime temperatures in order to uh, to color up nicely. So that's that's a struggle for us here. We're currently not really doing anything uh, for heat mitigation other than utilizing our natural environment. We found that planting some of the uh, using our, our orchard is surrounded by deciduous forest here in Pennsylvania. And we're finding that some of the areas that are closer to the wood line, surrounded by woods on two to three sides of the orchard, actually do much better with some of those varieties like Gala and Honeycrisp, uh, not getting the sunburn that we do when we plant them in the wide open sections, uh, center of a field. Thank you, Steve. Um, Jared, just going back to uh, the conditions that you share, we understand that these conditions might be happening in the spring, uh, heat in the spring or in the summer. How that translate for you in terms of fruit quality? What are the issues that you are seeing in terms of your fruit uh, production, quality and storability? Uh, yeah, some of the biggest issues we have are, are uh, similar to Steve, where, you know, we, if we have a, a long summer, like we did last summer, and we, we weren't cooling off at night and we stayed hot through pretty much through October. We really had a hard time coloring through. That, that made things a real challenge for us last summer. And then the other thing we typically see is not so much sunburn damage, but um, you know, uh, some maybe increase in bitter pit and honey crisp if we're overhead cooling a lot, trying to, you know, you're trying to keep that soil a little drier, um, but yet you're overhead, you're overhead cooling. So it's difficult to do that. Um, and then also, uh, you know, internal browning has been an issue when we get really hot summers. See that a little more in galas and, and pink ladies. So those have been kind of our biggest issues. So Steve, uh, in in that in relates to that, the food quality you mentioned that the main issue that you see is in coloring, right? Uh, because of these hot nights. Do you, you mentioned in our pre-meeting that you also see that there's uh, hot <laughs> winters, um, that you're facing some of these hot winters. What are the, that condition? So the, the biggest concerns I have for our warm winters is obviously not, trees not having enough dormancy um, and coming out of dormancy too early in the spring. For our peaches in particular, what really worries me is the chilling hours. Um, so I I'm pleasantly surprised we have a great peach crop this year, but going into the spring, I was really, really worried because we only had a handful of days that were below freezing in December. Other than that, it was in the fifties and the high forties uh, all through February, March, and then bang, April came and it was one of the fastest blooms that I can ever remember. It was, you know, we, we jumped ahead and, we jumped ahead in, in growth periods really rapidly this spring, and I was actually pleasantly surprised to see how much fruit set because I was worried about that the, the peaches didn't have enough chilling hours. Um, in terms of one of the things that we did mention when we, we were talking in our pre-meeting, for us, that concerns us in, in fruit quality and storability is we're fortunate to be our own packer and packing our own fruit as well. So most certainly that fruit that's coming in on those 98 degree days, Gala in particular, we're marking that on the bins and tagging that and cataloging those rows. So those are some of the first fruit that we pack and get out the door um, because we de definitely find that the hotter that fruit comes in, the longer it takes us to cool it down, the shorter amount of time that we can store it. Thank you, Steve, for that. And I don't see Randy from uh, New York, but Mario Miranda is uh, here and he was in our pre-meeting. Maybe you, Mario, can share some of the um, Randy Hart's comments on the impact of the heat during the harvest and how that affects the fruit 
quality, but also the operation. Yeah, I don't recall exactly. I, I, I think the brand is located in Champlain Valley. Um, I don't recall if he mentioned or not if he was experiencing sunburn issue, but um, with the heat, but the reality in the Lake Ontario fruit region, uh, that is a little more to the south, but next to Lake Ontario, uh, we have sunburn. And, and we are picking fruit sometimes without knowing uh, the, the typical symptoms of sunburn. So we're putting fruit in the beans that go to storage and that is producing some physiological disorders in some cases. So um, we start with some burn, some burn protection, uh, at least in Western New York. I, I don't know if Randy was using something in Champlain, but we are using sun growers, sun burn protection, starting at around 38, 44 millimeter gold ball size. Uh, sun grower are protecting their rows, at least in the west side, more than in the east side, um, doing less leaf pruning, perhaps in the in the west side that is more exposed to the sun in the afternoon. And also now with the pneumatic defoliation, sun grower paying a little more attention also to the manual defoliation or the pneumatic defoliation. So it's an issue. Uh, I recall that we also mentioned that in Hudson Valley, uh, growers, I think so, when a heat wave is coming in advance the day before, they try to irrigate uh, those orchards and that is helping them to cool uh, the plant and have some kind of mitigation for sunburn. That's a little summary. Thank you, Mario. Christy, you wanna go with the next? Yeah, I'm just curious in terms of, um, so, I mean, the, the talk in terms of the sunburn and the focus of, of during the day, I'm wondering um, in terms of impacts from uh, warmer nights um, and what sort of mitigation, if any, that you can do with that. Has there been anything that you've been doing, Garrett? Anything we try to do to get color, um, and that's how we deal with warmer nights, is is just trying to get some color uh, in the fall. Is is we'll run our irrigation over through the night, or at least for a few hours. Some guys will run it. Depends on uh, the orchard and and the management, but uh, we'll run our overhead cooling at night to try to get some of that uh, field heat out to get that swing in daytime, nighttime temperature to help try to help get the color to come along, and it it can be helpful. Um, just depends. Like last year, it wasn't as helpful, but generally, we find that to be pretty helpful in getting the color to come. And Steve, do you have any comments with that? Not in particular, no. So I'm going to follow up with Steve. Then, uh, when we had the pre meeting, we talked about some mitigation strategies that are not necessarily targeted to sunburn protection, but you do make some measures related to, for example, the location of your orchard or managing your cover crop. Can you talk a little bit about that and thinking about the, the heat in the afternoons and some varieties, how you manage, what type of measures you take? As, as I mentioned previously, the, the best the best thing that we're finding is we we start to plant, you know, tear out more and more old blocks of fruit. And it seems like everything that is popular for sale these days is in the early part of the season, like Gale and Honeycrisp. So we're planting more and more of those cultivars and getting rid of a lot of the mid-season stuff, um, you know, as we, you know, pick which sites we're going to use, we're finding, and it's a lot of it is by sort of a hunch by watching what was happening in Washington with overhead cooling and with, with, with shading, leveraging the, 
the shade that we're given from the deciduous forest around the orchard. And we're certainly finding that the combination of high coloring honey crisp cultivars and planting those, you know, in, in spots that are going to get afternoon shade and only morning sun is resulting in cooler nights in that section of the orchard and better fruit color for us. Um, so now the orchard's only so big, so there's only going to be so far that we're going to be able to go for that. And what's in the back of my mind is the effect that will, the benefit that we're going to get from netting, uh, overhead netting, uh, both in terms of cooling and hail, um, hail protection. Um, and I think that that's probably the direction that we're going to look in the future as we continue to explore this subject. Our row middles are incredibly important to us. We talked about this in the water talk. Uh, our orchard has a lot of steep terrain. So managing those row, row middles for safety aspect and uh, for the, the tractor traction and, and to keep things from sliding and having jackknifes and accidents is, is really important. But we also find that helps with orchard cooling as well. The, the narrower we can keep the weed strip along the fruiting wall, and the wider that we can keep that grass row, it, it really does help with the heat, uh, you know, and the reflection of that heat coming back up off the orchard floor in the, in the hot, late hot summers. Do you also mention something that I thought in interesting, Anna, and after you answer this one, I would like Garrett to, to add to that too. How you manage then when you know you had a heat event or conditions that are negative for your fruit quality, how you manage the decision from harvest to selling the fruit? Do you make any decisions there? I'm laughing because it's in, it very un, it's not sophisticated at all. So I I'm you know I run the orchard and our packing operation. We're not a huge operation, so I'm able to cover both ends of that and receive the fruit as it's coming in the door. So certainly I'm keeping track of environmental conditions. Oh, we lost him. Uh, so I'm I'm sure he's gonna get back to us. But Gary, can you tackle that that? question you also mentioned that in your in our pre-meeting of things that you manage that are not directly to sunburn protection but that are side uh, management practices that can benefit uh, preserving that fruit quality well, yeah i mean i guess we benefit also from uh being part of a packing shed and uh and we we have our own trucking so we're moving fruit in as fast as we can throughout the day and you know you know, usually in early season, we get through galas and honey crisp, and maybe we get the temperature start to drop. But until then, you know, we don't leave any fruit out in the field. It all comes in, and it's and uh, at the warehouse level, they're they're filling multiple rooms at one time. They may be taking galas, like galas for example, and putting them in in three different rooms, but not filling them. And then because you can get the temperature out of them faster by you know doing a little bit in each room, so they know they stagger. Um, how many bins they'll put in a room to get that temperature out as fast as they can. But yeah, it is critical. So our big thing is is getting fruit to the warehouse as quick as you can and, and getting it cooled down. So, and then we always, well, always, we, you know, we're always out of the field. If it hits 90, we're, we're we, we usually get out of harvest and, and, uh, and around 90, we'll, we'll, we'll get out of harvest to try to get that fruit out. Unless we get behind, and then you're always you're just trying to get fruit off before the maturity gets you. Thank you, Garrett. Christy. Um, yeah, I do just want to uh, remind the audience that um, if you have any questions, um, anything that you want to uh, put in the chat, or feel free to raise your hand, um, and that includes uh, bringing Randy into this as well. If you have any questions for Randy, then then feel free to do that. Um, Bernadita, I don't know if you wanted to go back to that previous question that was asked about the thermal imaging, because there was a response that was also brought forward in the chat. I don't know if maybe that's something, well, we, we wait to get Steve back on to finish his answer. Is that something that you'd want, you want to revisit? Yeah, definitely. And it does actually flow nicely to our uh, next questions, which were related to what are the management practices uh, that you foresee in the future that will help you to deal with the heat stress? Um, so I know that Lav answered this question and I would like him to maybe share the answer with the audience. Lav, are you able to, to share the, the answer related to um, imaging of the orchards? 
Yeah. So can you hear me, Bernadita? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, I think the question is about can we image the art like our entire orchard and, and see hot and cold spots and things of that nature. It definitely is a good idea, right? Um, the point is, and we have done aerial imagery and ground, ground imagery as well. You don't want to collect thermal imagery when the canopies are wet, like with evaporative cooling or rain and things of that nature, because the emissivity is what is going to give a, a give you, you know, um, govern the thermal imagery pixel values, right? And so you want to have no wet canopies. And also, probably if you're looking at fruit, probably want to use ground-based imagery than aerial imagery for uh, such mapping uh, to some extent, yeah. Thank you, Lav. And I didn't introduce Lav properly. So Lav Cott is a professor also at Washington State University and doing a lot of work with uh, aerial imaging and, and sensor analysis for, for our um, fruit quality in Washington. And we have a project together and one of his students gonna present about that tomorrow. So thank you, Lav, for that answer. And I, I would like to add also that, and it relates to what Randy was mentioning in his presentation that uh, the high temperature in the orchard, we're not only thinking about sunburn, di that direct effect of sunburn to the fruit, but we also, and maybe even more importantly, we're thinking about the impact of high temperatures and having these hot spots, identifying the hot spots in your orchard where you have um, higher stress will be reflected in high temperature in the trees too. So there was another question that came through in the chat. Um, and so Doug is wondering whether or not there's a handheld tool to monitor incoming solar radiation. Not sure if there's anyone there who wants to tackle yeah. that, Randy. Yeah, not, there is, yeah. <laughs> they manufacture small handheld devices. And I use these uh, for that project that I mentioned in India as well, but it's a small handheld device. I think they're a little bit pricey, but you can often find them on places like eBay that are used and work just fine. Uh, but yeah, they'll give you the solar incoming radiation. And I think you they probably even offer different filters or different probe types that will give you different kinds of light. So usually they're for photosynthetically active radiation, PAR, but some of them are just on total insulation, so the number of watts per square meter. So those are the useful ones. And those are used for like solar power, kinds of things like that. I did want to make a comment. Can I just break in with a yes, comment? Yes, of course. Is that okay? Yeah, so uh, I was just about evaporative cooling. So, we, I mean, I studied evaporative cooling, at least for evaporative cooling structures, a lot. And in most places in the planet, um, and actually the Northwest uh, United States is kind of outside of this in the Sahara, <laughs> but in most places, the humidity goes up to nearly saturation almost every night. So even in Delhi in Rajasthan, where it's a very dry climate, the humidity gets up over 80% at night. So you get almost no evaporative cooling at night. And so if you looked at those graphics that I shared where temperatures need to be somewhere uh, south of, let's say, 70 or 75 degrees to get proper um, color formation. Uh, yeah, you're going to, if your evaporative cooling or your wet bulb temperature, if that is not below that number, then you're not getting any benefit uh, due to evaporation, either from the fruit or from applying water to the surface of the fruit, or I should say you're getting minimal benefit. So that makes some sense. Um, and so if you know the humidity, and I, actually I have kind of a little graphic sort of thing that I could easily share, but if you know the humidity and you know the temperature, you can calculate the wet bulb. So you'll know what it'll cool to, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Randy, for that. And, and, and maybe following on that idea, I want to ask Jared, uh, because here in Washington, that the nights do get very dry. And what are the side effects that you see by using some of these techniques? You mentioned overhead cooling. Do you think that that has an impact on your fruit quality as well as using the sunburn protectants? Do you have any recommendations of when you start using the sunburn protectants for different varieties? Can you share a little bit about your practices in your orchard? Yeah, I found it, I mean, I was really interested in uh, Lee's comment about, uh, you know, the susceptibility of fruit, you know, 
earlier versus at maturity, um, we generally start early. You know, uh, we can't predict how much sun exposure these fruits can have over the course of the season. So, you know, we get to that golf ball stage. If we see temperatures uh, in the 90s coming, then, you know, we either, we see just a short blip, then we'll usually just come in and we don't want to really start the overhead cooling. So we'll just come in and, and, and make an application of a sunburn protectant. But if it looks like it's going to be prolonged, then we'll just start a normal program of uh, overhead cooling. And then where, where we have water quality issues or we don't have enough water, or we don't have a pond, then, then we'll start with our sunburn protectants at that time. But we usually start early and go often. And, we, you know, we, if, if we're thinning, and uh, we're going to hit temperatures above 85. We'll always come back behind our thinning. When we quit thinning for the day, we come back behind and put sunburn protectant because we've, uh, mm -hmm. we've opened, exposed new fruit to potential sunburn. So um, that's one thing we all we do. Um, and that will be probably recommended also if you're planning to do some summer pruning, right? Uh, like Mario mentioned, some growers in the east, and we do it also in the in here in the west side that we do summer pruning. Uh, when will you do the summer pruning in terms of environmental conditions and what would you do after that if you expect high temperatures? I mean, in a perfect world, we'd like to be, you know, three weeks ahead of harvest to get in there and summer prune. Some days, some, some years, and depends on we have our labor and and what else we have going on some days were, you know, some years were, you know, 10 days or some, we don't get it done, but we like to be three weeks. That way we can get it, you know, mowed and get it ready. And then when we we're ready to put my lard down, we're usually seven to 10 days before harvest, we'll put my lard down to help color come on, on the uh, galas, Fuji's, uh, honeys, depending on the temperature. Well, all that's different. You know, if we're going to have hot days, a lot of times, and we don't have all red cooling, we'll just avoid uh, the mylar because it creates a lot of sunburn if you put it down and you get a heat on top of it. Thank you, Garrett. And I wonder, Carolina, you've done um, a lot of work and in the project that we have, there was a question prior in the chat that mentioned what would be the benefit of that um, keeping the trees uh, well moist um, and given that we've been monitoring that condition pre-harvest uh, do you want to share anything about uh, those preconditions uh, for fruit quality? Yeah sure um, um, I'm Carolina Torres <laughs> I have to introduce myself Post-harvest scientist here, but don't worry about it. Uh, Washington State University. And yes, I've been uh, working for a very long time on the effect of climate on fruit quality um, in different environments, but mostly on environments with, with hot and, and dry, dry environments. So very low relative humidity, around 30% during the summer, 30, 40%, and very high temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, um, so very high. Um, so one of the things with this areas that I've worked in now here in Washington is the presence of microclimate. So uh, that is uh, tricky, but also, uh, you know, we, I cannot only focus on the overall uh, effect of, of weather, of climate on the area, but actually uh, unpredictable weather events in the different uh, seasons, growing seasons. And then uh, also very important in this area is to look and then connect pre-harvest to post-harvest. It's, it's uh, retrieve fruit from the same group of trees. Uh, so I do follow commercial blocks uh, year after year. And so by now I have, uh, I've been follow um, a couple of uh, blocks, commercial blocks for four years. Um, I'm hoping to go up to seven years and then look at all these different uh, weather patterns every year and the effect of fruit quality, pre-harvest, going into post-harvest, um, the whole the whole chain, uh, cold chain. It is really relevant because uh, during these four years I've been here, uh, none of the seasons have been the same. Uh, there are huge differences uh, on when does the heat happens during the growing season and the presence of smoke um, due to wildfires which is a surprise to me, uh, but there, those are events that are gonna become more frequent due to climate change. And that has a huge effect on fruit maturity. 
So we know a lot about smoke effect on wine grapes and how does it affect wine and taint, uh, but we don't know anything about other fruit like apples that don't, you know, we don't process it. Uh, well, we have juice, but probably that's taken away during the process of, of making juice. So yeah, and, uh, and then the other thing I, I wanna focus on is prediction. So when the heat happens in different times during the growing season, what will potentially happen to the fruit, not only at harvest, but post-harvest? Um, all the sunburn gets called out. Uh, so fruit that goes into storage has mild sunburn maybe, um, never moderate or severe sunburn and clean. It's all clean, no sunburn symptoms and everything happens afterwards. The other uh, observation I was gonna make that um, last year was very, uh, very um, tricky for apples uh, and fruit in general. Uh, low, uh, low temperature spring, chilling temperatures during spring, and then two heat, uh, two heat waves. Uh, fruit at harvest had a lot of ethylene, uh, which didn't happen the three years before. Um, so, you know, maturity came on really fast and having stored that fruit in three different systems, just regular air, and then uh, just CA, static CA, and then DCA with very low oxygen levels was really very detrimental for Honeycrisp. Um, a lot of uh, CO2 really uh, injury, which is not really soggy breakdown, which also was high, or soft scald, uh, which was also high in this system. So I'm really finding very unique um, patterns uh, in terms of quality for fruit coming of different growing seasons. So that's my goal, prediction. Thank you, Caro. Lina. Uh, there is a question that just came in through the chat. Um, is there a way to predict how many days or growing degree days it might take for newly exposed fruitlets to become more resistant to sunburn? for example, after hedging or summer pruning or thinning? I don't know. <laughs> Randy, any comments? No, yeah, no, no comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not an area that I, I found anything uh, that dealt with that topic. Yeah, so nothing. Or any comments from anyone else in that's uh, participating here? But it's almost like hardening off is what they're kind of asking, right? So do you make a move or make a change and then they're able to adjust over a period of time? Is that kind of what? Acclimation what in, yeah. yeah. It, it's really, yeah. I don't think there is an answer for, for that. Uh, so the data that it's published, it's in vitro, first of all. So that also changes things a lot. Mm. So I'm going to say that there is really no data uh, that I know of. I'm not sure if if Lee has anything, but I haven't Lee seen. Lee had to leave, so Lee is no longer in, in the call, unfortunately. I, had a, I have a question, and this goes out to everyone who's had experience in the orchard. Um, a colleague of mine down in Chile um, insists that... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> insists that the more leaves there are and in his case he's saying on a branch the more there is a risk of high temperature disorders like bitter pit and like sun scald more leaves more damage and his argument is that the leaves they fight for the water better than the fruit do right? They can open stomate. <clears throat> Fruits only have lenticels and they have this cuticle and it actually is an impediment to moisture loss. So if the fruit uh, are losing the battle for losing moisture, they're, they have very little potential for evaporative cooling. And that's what he suggests. And so as a result, when you have a large full canopy or more, more leaves on a given branch, and then you top that off with good uh, high fruit exposure, let's say to the sun. So however that canopy architecture is done that you have a greater chance of having problems and so we would walk through the orchard and he would say look at that branch and sure enough like i would say 60 percent 80 percent of the time you would see that their disorder is on a branch that is has better canopy development than one that has uh, low canopy development so that's a that's a comment and a question and it's not yeah. not a scientific study in any way <laughs> but i'm curious to know what people think about that I can uh, avoid uh, 
jumping in for this question on Peter Pitt. Um, and I think that what we are seeing or what he is seeing in, in Chile is, some, is the multiple factors that will lead to Peter Pitt, right? So one of them actually is the high vigor, which is where very well known and reported. So if you have more canopy uh, due to high vigor, you have that high competition and the bypass of the calcium going towards the shoots because they move through the transpiration flow. Calcium moves only through xylem to, through the transpiration flow, but that will be only in the early stages of development. So if you have that imbalance of high vigor versus a low crop load, you will have a high level of, or more likelihood of bitter pit. Um, I see that Lai Lang Cheng was in the call and, and I wonder if he, he is of course an expert on, on bitter pit and calcium related disorders. And I don't know if he wants to um, mention something about that. Um, I think um, you already made the comment on bitter pit. I just want to uh, provide a comment, making a comment on the uh, situation Randy described. Somehow my uh, camera is not on. That's okay. Um, uh, I think, Randy, there is an acclimation issue. So if a branch has a lot of leaves, then uh, I guess a larger proportion of the fruit surface is shaded and then later in the season you know if let's say when the fruit weight changes the branch you know the angle changes and then some of the fruits get exposed to full sunlight so there is a there is a, a balance there so you you want to have enough leaf area to provide some level of protection for the fruits but not too much if you have too much the fruits get shaded early or mid-season. And later on, when the fruits are too big, uh, all of a sudden, they get fully exposed. I think that's when the problem shows up. That's my take on it. So on the bitter pit issue, uh, Bernadita already described it. So I will not make any comment. Thank In you, Laila. Comment, my comment on sounds called um, it's uh, fully related to exposure, but of course, sun-exposed fruit, uh, stress fruit by sun, will develop sun scald in a in a in a situation of uh, getting into cold storage, and uh, with no sunburn sy symptoms. So the higher the the more severe sunburn symptom, the more sun skull and faster will appear post harvest. But fruit that is totally clean, sun exposed, will also develop it in a lower percentage and and later in storage. So Carolina, following on that, I think that Lee, when Lee was talking about early sunburn, and that sometimes get color over, and so it mm. kind of disappear at harvest. We yeah. think that that fruit that is sunburned earlier in the season then will have more likelihood to have uh, storage disorders. And this the same question for Randy. Uh, if we're talking about sun scald, uh, which is one of the disorders related to sun exposure, yes, even if it's covered over, um, you will see the pro you know the the disorder afterwards. But it's definitely a serious one only in Granny Smith. Um, I've seen sun skull and gala and, and honey crisp and other varieties, but it's less common and, uh, and less severe in a way. So since grannies are, are green, that fruit still, when it's sun exposed, it has a lighter green, but it doesn't have any yellowing or brown uh, tissue on the sun exposed that is not sunburn. And yes, it will get sun skull post harvest. So yeah, if it covers over with uh, red pigment and it's it's not severe enough the stress that that section of the fruit got, then you won't have sun scald. But you do have a different phenotype, meaning there is still higher solid with solids, uh, a, a little higher firmness, texture is different compared to the unexposed side of the same fruit. 
Uh, so yeah, but the red cover coverage is pretty much, it could be pretty much the same. I would only comment that, yeah, fruit integrate everything that happens to them throughout the growing season, right? It doesn't go away. So if they're stressed or damaged in some way, they will respond to it. And if they can, you know, if it if it looks okay, I guess that's all right. But you can bet that exactly what Carolina said, that that it's remembered in the fruit. And if it gets to a certain level, it will be stressed and potentially you'll see those symptoms reemerge in the storage. Yeah. One thing I have to, um, I want, just want to comment um, and uh, just an inf side information, but I've never, I had never seen before um, heat stress damage that we call it here in Washington. And it's brown and desiccated and depressed area on certain parts of the fruit that got heat. So we, we saw that in the, during 2021, the heat, the, the huge heat wave fruit hanging on the tree, but I've seen it after that uh, in storage. And it's not, it's just the surface. So it's the peel and you see depression. Um, so it could, you know, for somebody that doesn't, um, well, maybe they, it gets mixed with CO2 injury, for example, and it's not. So yeah, it's a weird symptoms. And yes, you showed one of them, so. But this is really, I've never seen it before, so severe. I believe, Emily, you have a question. Feel free to jump in. Yeah, yeah. I was going to change topics a little bit. So Daniel and I were chatting on the side about using evaporative cooling in the east. And we're in Michigan. Just because we have such high disease pressure, we were just kind of wanted to pose the question if you thought, Randy, if you thought it would be possible or if others wanted to comment, because we do deal with scab you know, we're, we're just coming to the end of primary scab here and we deal with summer rots um, or for the folks out West, if you guys deal with any of those disease issues when you use evaporative cooling. So any thoughts on that? I guess we're fortunate. We, we do not <laughs> generally deal with those issues. Yeah, we we do get a lot of rain though, and this last week is a pretty good example of you know a lot of wetting that went on, and so there's a lot of natural wetting that goes on as well. Yeah, we're just too too humid here. I think for most days, you really get much benefit. I think your humidities need to be somewhere in the thirty to forty to fifty percent range. I think anything above that, we're just typical of a day here in Michigan, and we only see the sun every fifth day anyway. So I mean, it's it's just probably not very useful. Okay, so that's even outside of the rot issue. The, our humidity is just too high, you think? Mm -hmm, I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share that data with you. Like I say, we have millions of data points. We can put together an actually kind of a nice map for expectations for um, evaporative cooling uh, across the state of Michigan or state of Washington or whatever we like. But... That would actually be uh, quite useful for us in Pennsylvania as well. So if you're going to do that, we've been talking about uh, doing some follow on publications and sharing of uh, slides and so forth once this series is complete. So if that's something that uh, you need some help with, you know, we'd like to see that. OK, OK, I'll talk to my colleagues that put this together. They generalized it and well, it's, it's the pixels are actually quite small, just a couple of few miles across. But they generalize it for the planet because that's our initial goal. But uh, yeah, we can do it for any area of the country. It's just a matter of putting in the right filters, as, as I understand it. I, I have well, one comment along oh, those sorry, lines about uh, using the overhead cooling out there. One thing to think about if you're considering shade uh, is that those systems do stay warmer. And for any of the early summer apples, like, you know, we grow rave and sweet tango and, and uh, you know, in the honey crisp, uh, if you're using shade, we use overhead cooling, uh, especially in the evening on, on those uh, summer varieties to help bring the color. And we've found it under the shade, it does retard the color, does hold the color back. And so, um, but, it, you, you know, for us using overhead cooling in the evening is really help bring that color. So that may it may impact you differently than us using the using the shade. 
Yeah, and just to add to Gerd's comment, uh, the work that uh, we've been doing with Carolina, Lab, Cot, and Basavara shows the same that that uh, the netting does increase the temperature, especially in the night, affecting the color development. And so keeping your orchard moist, also the, the trees well watered uh, is very important to preserve that quality of the tree and also the fruit. Um, <clears throat> You, Garrett, also mentioned something in the pre-meeting that maybe is a good advice for growers in relation to using the, the fogging and the uh, sunburn protectants. You were saying, and I'm not so sure if I got it right, but you were saying to not use calcium carbonate protectants where you're using fogging, is that correct? Well, I would say any of those products, if you're using uh, surround or or um, calcium carbonate products, uh, and you're using either overhead cooling or fogging. You know, I know some guys do it. We don't like to do it because on the warehouse side, it's really hard to get that off. So I think you go one or the other. You know, so like if we go early and we'll do a couple applications, we don't continue that during the season because when you it seems like it almost bakes it on uh, when you when you add the water over the top of the of the you know calcium carbonate products and you keep applying them both you know you're overhead cooling and then in between you're using one of the calcium carbonate products it's, it makes it that's what that's what we find makes it really difficult to get off in the warehouse where we use surround and we don't use any overhead cooling it generally comes off pretty easily in the, in the warehouse but it's when you start adding combining them and I believe that Randy in that conversation also mentioned in New York that when using these products, you can enhance the lenticel uh, damage, right, in, in the orchard. Yeah, yeah, I think was they found, well, yeah, it was surround, I know, and Fuji's and probably some other varieties. That's why we just use surround basically on honeys and honey crisp and, and grannies, because it does, it can impact fruit finish more than, you know, some of the, the, the calcium carbonate products. Yes, yeah, so Christy, you want to close with the last question for Garrett, he's our only yes. grower here. <laughs> yeah, our token grower, <laughs> Garrett. We're going to let you have the final word here. <laughs> of, uh, so just kind of a summary. I mean, there we, we can talk about so many of these things for, for quite some time, but um, I think the overarching ask is what uh, what growers are needing then to better be able to predict and understand these kind of extreme events like heat events. Um, wondering if you have any sort of closing remarks with that. Well, that's a big ask. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe some real-time evaluations of the uh, efficacy uh, of our programs, how, how, how well they're working in real time versus, you know, you get to the end and you Kind of then you see, uh, you know, how much sunburn you have, or you see, you know, how much, you know, uh, internal browning you you uh, you pick up in storage, or some of the other storage issues that we see. So, how, you know, maybe it's a better way to evaluate it, you know, how how effective we are, you know, in real time. And I'm going to quote you, Garrett, from our previous meeting that you mentioned something that uh, also Randy mentioned that. Um, we need to learn how to look at the fruit differently, right? So, and, and there's different response to the environment uh, in relation to different varieties. So having better probably indicators, right? Uh, to be able to assess not only your program, but what is that quality of your fruit that you're growing and look at it uh, in a different way. I'm quoting you, by the way. <laughs> One, one question I had for uh, Randy was, uh, Randolph, Randy, was uh, we talked about retain a little bit. And my question is, is retain, if used properly, would that be better for internal browning or for post-harvest storage issues versus a harvesta because you're stopping that, you know, process so much earlier? Because you, well, you were talking about dropping how fast pressures drop, like before... You know, we may start sampling galas three weeks before harvest, you know, to time our harvesta application. And, you know, we're maybe sitting there at 20, 20 some pounds, but you're talking about, you know, maybe a couple of weeks before that, they were sitting at 30 pounds. Yeah, yeah, which they will do, yeah. 
Yeah. So I I don't I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I I don't know what you would use to as an indicator. You know, as to as a predictor. You know what you're doing by monitoring early. I mean, especially early is at least you're looking at one thing, and that is you know how how well the fruit holds together, what its firmness is, what its long term trend is going to be, and I think that actually has some value. But to get back at that question before, I I think there is value in maybe not necessarily what I would call maturity analysis, but condition analysis, so that you're looking at it, you know, in the two or three weeks before for it. 35 pounds pressure and you do it again and a week later and you're down to 30, you, you, you can draw a line and see where that trend is heading. I, I think it might be valuable. I don't know of any studies that have done that kind of thing, um, but you know, it's not that difficult to do. I, I will say this one thing, and this is something I did. This, this is part of that study. And I think there is, you know, to, to follow on uh, Bernadita's, comment we used a simple um tape recorder and we would thunk fruit with a pen we'd hit them with the pen and it would record it and then it would predict the firmness of the fruit and it works really well as long as the fruit is attached to the tree as soon as they start to lose moisture it doesn't work anymore it could because you know the outer layers get soft but on the tree it worked really really well and so we had a nice correlation between firmness and then this vibrational frequency but i wouldn't be surprised that there isn't a way to go out there and just tap 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 you know with an indicator so somebody creates an indicator that says okay you're at roughly this concentration this or this this firmness level so it's just a device that could be developed or invented but maybe yeah maybe what you said bernadita has some real merit that maybe there are ways of going out there and looking at things um, differently well before the development or the onset of maturity can can give us some clues as to what we're, what's going to happen further down the pipe. You know, people do a lot of that kind of work with metabolomics and that kind of thing, but, you know, maybe the fruit are speaking to us in other ways, too. I, I just want to make a comment, uh, Garrett, about that, about Harvista and and retain. There are two mode of actions there. Um, so depending on what you want to achieve with a retain application, ABG is how do, would you how would you do um, how would you apply it and how many times? Um, now that we're, I'm I'm doing a little bit of work on um, with those two with the uh, uh, WAS38. Uh, if you really want to target uh, the greasiness caused by ethylene. We have to know when that ethylene starts to rise, right? Uh, and that, so 21 days would be the earliest and most recommended time for retain. So, but but as but if you want other uh, retain to do other things besides targeting and actually delaying the most you can uh, on ethylene production, you have to hit it that early, 21 days before harvest. Um, Harvista, so then, then you go on. Right, you can do then after that, you can do 14 days or seven days and up to three days, really, which does not work good for greasiness. So, then, so then again, I mean, the same type of work, and I'm sure there's a lot of publication have, uh, has been done for Gala, for example, and where what most effectively you will actually affect the post harvest quality of that fruit. The problem with all that research is that is assuming you don't you're not putting one MCP because once you do one MCP at harvest, everything related to ethylene and how that modulates everything else post harvest doesn't really apply anymore. And so then harvest is the other is the other is the same thing. Um, and the most recommended time of application for harvista to do his the the retention and maintenance of fruit quality last year didn't work because ethylene was being produced so early that at the time that we apply Harvista, nothing happened to the greasiness, for example. So because fruit was already producing ethylene and greasiness related to ethylene was already triggered. So yeah, there is, there is a little bit of, um, I think more that we normally know that when those treatment would be effective for what, and then evaluate which one is better. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to say I I kind of forgot where I was headed with where I was what my comments were because they actually do 
the the linkage was that retain is applied during that early developmental phase right so you're suppressing those low low ethylene levels that are driving the onset of ripening right and it doesn't really affect sensitivity as carolina just said so so yeah so you're going to have two very different responses so when we apply retain for instance they'll ripen perfectly fine they ripen right along with everything else there's no post harvest benefit to retain unless you shut down ethylene production while it's still sensing the retain that that you know that that they experience at harvest and we rarely see um, negative effects of retain I don't see it very often, but negative effects of retain in terms of the post-harvest sensitivities to like CO2 injury. And I'm not saying it's not there, but I don't see it so much. But we, so if you move them from, you know, the field into CA storage and they're still feeling the effects of retain, you'll see some benefits there. Whereas one MCP um, can enhance those sensitivities because you've shut down the normal system that allows the plant to respond to stresses, changes in temperatures, normal ripening, and development that takes place after the onset of ripening. Hence, CO2 injury is enhanced in some way, which is still not understood. <laughs>